King Sudhadana also ordered that a beautiful garden be built around the three palaces, which was to have many ponds, containing lotus plants of various colors. So the prince could take a walk or a horseback ride or do whatever he enjoyed most. The years went by very quickly, and Prince Siddhartha had now become a young man. All the material things the king had bestowed on him turned out to be valueless to the contemplative prince. The king had thought that his actions would make the prince happy, but everything proved to be in vain. He then summoned his ministers to a meeting, asking them if there were any other means to prevent the prince from abandoning his position as potential leader of the country, to become a religious teacher, as the old Asita had predicted. The officials offered this opinion, the best way to hold the prince is to seek out the most beautiful girl in the land and have the prince get married her. Once the prince has experienced the sweetness of married life, he will choose nothing else. Then he will follow your intention and take over the throne in the future. The king considered the suggestion offered by the ministers as all right. So he ordered that the selection of the most beautiful girl in the country was to take place. On the particular day set for the selection, all candidates had to come to the city of Kapilavathu. Each of them was required to walk in front of the prince and would receive a present from him. The king also ordered a group of highly intelligent officials to be stationed in the place where the beautiful girls were to pass before the prince. Their duty was to observe carefully which girl the prince liked best. On the day of the beauty contest, candidates from all over the country passed, one after the other, in front of the prince they were all very beautiful. Each of them received a present directly from the hand of the prince. The girls were all very happy and felt honored to accept a present from the prince. However, when they returned to their groups, they all began to fear that they might not be pretty enough. For they felt that, Prince Siddhartha was unlike other young men, he had not paid attention to their beauty at all. Indeed, the prince had handed a present to each of the girls, but his mind, all the time, appeared to be centered on some other thing, which was much more important than the smiling appearances and beautiful and sensual bodily movements of the girls. And that was why some of the girls said that when the prince had handed them presents, they felt that he was not an ordinary human being at all, but, on the contrary, that he was a celestial being. The line of girls had come to an end, and the presents were all given away the prince still sat calmly, thinking about other things. Everyone thought that the last contestant had come before the prince and received her present, but suddenly a beautiful girl entered hastily, for she had arrived late. When this girl entered, the observers noticed that the prince was somewhat astonished. Like the other girls had done, she also walked before the prince, shyly with bowed head. But after she had passed by, she looked back smilingly and asked, Any present for me? The prince replied, I am really sorry, but all the presents are gone however you may have this. And he took from his neck a beautiful golden chain and wound it about the girl's arm. The officials who were ordered by the king to observe, were very happy to see this. They discovered that the girl who had entered last was Yesodhara, the daughter of King Supabuddha. They reported this to King Suddhadana, who sent his minister to visit King Supabuddha, proposing that Princess Yesodhara marry Prince Siddhartha. The people at the foot of the Himalayas were strong and brave. So, according to the custom of the Sakya clan, when a young prince was about to marry, he had to demonstrate to the public that he was a clever man and as skilled in horseback riding, archery, and fencing as the brave young men were. Respecting this custom, Prince Siddhartha openly invited all the clever and brave youth of the country to a contest of skill at Kapilavathu. Every one of these youths was an expert horseman, archer, and fencer. Each young man, in turn, demonstrated his skills in front of the king, his officials, and the people. Prince Siddhartha also participated in the contest, riding his white horse Kahaka, and he turned out to be the most skillful of all the youths. In archery, Prince Siddhartha shot farther than his cousin Prince Debdetta, who was regarded by all as the best archer in the country. As a swordsman, Prince Siddhartha was able to cut down a tree with one stroke. After he struck the tree, the tree remained standing, so the witnesses thought the prince had missed. But when the wind began to blow, the tree toppled slowly down, for the prince had sliced through the tree with no trace. 
The blade of the sword had passed through the tree as if it had cut through cream. In the fencing contest, the prince was also the victor with honor. Before that, his stepbrother, Prince Nanda, was generally recognized as the top swordsman next came the horse racing contest. Prince Siddhartha's white horse Kahaka ran so fast that the other racers were left far behind. So the other contestants complained, the prince wins so easily just because he has the fastest horse. Anyone riding Kahaka would win the first place. But if someone were to race that rarely mounted strange black horse, then whoever the rider might be would surely be the loser. So they exchanged their horses, everyone trying, in turn, to mount that fierce proud black horse, but it threw everyone to the ground. It was now Prince Anaretta's turn to try, and being the best rider in the country, he mounted the black horse with only a slightest effort, and then he whipped it hard to force it to run around the yard. However, Prince Anaretta stayed in place for only a moment, for unexpectedly this fierce, untamed horse reared, turned its head, and caught the prince's leg in its mouth and threw him from its back to the ground. If the yard guards had hesitated in going to help him or remain behind the horse without beating it, the wild animal would most probably have killed Prince Anaretta. Now it was Prince Siddhartha's turn to mount. Everybody felt that if even Prince Anaretta, the best rider in the country, had been thrown and almost killed, Prince Siddhartha could probably do no better. But Prince Siddhartha approached the horse lightly and put one hand on its neck, while rubbing its nose with his other hand and at the same time softly whispering a few words, and then tapping the horse on the sides of its body. Everybody was quite surprised that the fierce black horse had really calmed down, letting the prince ride him and obediently moving forward or backward as the prince directed. The people who were gathered there clearly saw that the horse was acting completely according to the prince's will. It was the first time that any person had ever dared to come close to this proud horse and tame it without a whip. Finally everyone agreed that Prince Siddhartha was the best rider in the country and most qualified to be Princess Yesodara's husband. And King Sapabada was also very pleased to give the hand of his beloved daughter to the young, courageous Prince Siddhartha in marriage. The wedding of Princess Yesodara to Prince Siddhartha was an event in which the whole country rejoiced. The young couple lived in a palace that King Sudhadana had specially built for them, one which contained all kinds of splendid accommodations designed for the sole purpose of giving them comfort, satisfaction and pleasure. Now King Sudhadana began to feel relaxed, trusting that the prince would no longer think about leaving home. In order to prevent the prince from thinking of leaving home or of other things, King Sudhadana ordered that no one should ever mention in front of the prince anything to do with misery or unhappiness such as old age, sickness, death, etc. The attendants of the prince were ordered to constantly provide songs, dances, and music and never to appear tired before him. In addition to this, the king ordered the construction of high walls all around the palace and gardens where the prince lived. Only healthy and young people were allowed to enter into the gardens and palace from beyond the walls. Should someone within the walls accidentally fall and injure himself, the person had to be taken out immediately and could not return before complete recovery. The gates of the garden were closely guarded to prevent the prince from going outside for any reason, except with the king's permission. Although King Sudhadana had a selected group of attendants for the prince and tried in every way to keep his son from experiencing anything unpleasant in his life, the prince was not as happy as his father had hoped. The prince eagerly desired to see other joyful things of the world, things that were beyond the palace walls. The prince also wanted to know what the lives of people, other than those of the sons of kings and their officials, were like. Time and time again the prince pleaded with his father, informing him that he would never be happy unless he could see the outside world. Unable to refuse the persistent demand of the prince to travel outside the palace, King Sedhadana finally consented. He ordered that, on the day of the prince's outing, every house must be cleaned, painted and decorated with flags and flowers. Along the way no one was allowed to be seen working, and blind, sick, old and leprous people had to stay home until the carriage of the prince had passed. Everything was ready Prince Siddhartha in a splendid carriage, came out of the palace and toured around the city. Everywhere he saw crowds of people with smiling faces enthusiastically welcoming him. On seeing the prince, some people shouted, Long live the prince! 
while others approached his carriage and spread flowers on the road. The carriage thus continued moving on along the flower-covered path. Then, all at once, a white-haired old man, dressed in dirty rags, limped out of his house and reached the road before anyone could stop him. His haggard face was full of wrinkles and freckles, his eyes dull and dim, and only one tooth remained in his dry and withered mouth. His back was severely hunched and he had to rely on a cane to move his body. Wailing and begging along the road, he would certainly have starved to death if he had failed to get food for even one day. People were very much upset by the daring appearance of this old man since this was the prince's first excursion, and the king had issued an order prohibiting the presence of all old and sick people. They rushed to stop this old man from advancing further, wanting to drive him home, but it was already too late the prince had already seen him. Prince Siddhartha was quite surprised at the sight of the old man he did not know what that creature was. So he asked his driver Channa, Channa what is that a person? If he is a person, why is his back so curved and not as straight as other people's? Why does he shake in the hair? Why is it white? What happened to his eyes? Where are his teeth? Are some people born this way? Chana tell me what all this means. Chana replied, This is an old man. He was not born this way. When he came into the world, he was like everybody else. At first, he was also a strong and distinguished youth, having dense black hair and bright eyes. After having lived for a long time, he is changed into this shape. Don't let it bother you, Prince, for it is only the business of this old person. What does it mean, Chana? The Prince continued, Do you mean that it is very ordinary? Do you say that everyone will look like this after having lived for a long time, or is it not necessarily so I have not seen this condition before? Chana replied, When one has lived a long time, he will be like this it cannot be avoided Chana. Do you really mean that everybody will be like this someday, even you and I am a father my wife? Is it possible that all of us will any day have no teeth, have white hair and be hunchbacked, moving around with canes and shaking like this old man indeed so, answered Chana. When one lives long enough, he will be like this man, for no one can avoid getting old. Prince Siddhartha immediately told Chana to drive him back to the palace, for he was no longer in the mood to continue his journey around the city. He only wanted to be alone so that he could contemplate deeply the dreadful problem that he had just encountered. Soon he became aware that although he was the prince, the successor to the throne, he and the people dear to himself would, nevertheless, lose everything someday in the future. All his joys and pleasures would turn into nothing, for there would be no way to avoid getting old, and, in this matter, no one is an exception, whatever his condition may be rich, poor, powerful, or ordinary that night, Prince Siddhartha could not sleep. He was very disturbed when he thought that some day he and his wife would become old like that old man he had seen during the day. He then began to have grave doubts, thinking, has there ever been anyone in the world who has tried to find a way to avoid or transcend the cruel process of aging? If I, putting aside everything else, concentrate solely on this problem, can I not find a way to benefit myself and all other people? Someone related the incident that had happened during the excursion to the king. The king was very sad, and again ordered that a search be undertaken for interesting things to distract and amuse the prince. But, as had happened before, all was in vain. The young prince was not only indifferent to these things, but also once again asked his father's permission to go out, this time alone and unannounced, in order to see all the things of everyday life. Naturally the king did not want to give his permission, for he was afraid that this time the prince would see many ordinary people, who have to sweat and toil all their days, not sons of kings and rich men. He also feared that what the old sage had predicted might, indeed, come true. But love and compassion for his son finally forced him to permit the prince to go as he had requested. But he still hoped that those unpleasant things might not be seen by the prince this time. Prince Siddhartha went out on foot. He was disguised as a youth of a noble family and was followed only by Chana, who also dressed differently in order not to be recognized. So the prince, for the first time, saw the activities of an ordinary day in the capital many people were doing all different kinds of work. Blacksmiths pounded iron pieces with steel hammers to make plows, sickles, and oxen cartwheels, etc. Along the streets, there were shops of rich merchants. 
Craftsmen were making all kinds of adornments for women dye shops were full of cloth of various colors. Bakeries sold cakes to people waiting to buy them. At that time, Prince Siddhartha felt happy and was very glad to see the conditions of these industriously working people but soon bad and ugly things began happening again. While the prince was strolling along, he suddenly heard a moan on the roadside, which sounded as if someone was calling for help. The prince approached the area, looked at the place where the moan was coming from, and found a man lying on the ground, 